Today, we're going to die. August 15, 1971. Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. This was now 1972. I was in Vietnam, flying off an aircraft carrier. My co-pilot and I formed a business partnership, and we become gold prospectors. And we're reading this map of Vietnam, and it says, you know, this little pick and shovel with AU, gold. I said, okay, we're going to buy some gold at discount. And then we, he says, only one problem. I said, what's that? He says, the NVA just overran that gold mine. See me, that gold mine's in enemy territory? He goes, well, so let's go anyway. <laughs> Proving that Marines aren't the brightest guys in the world. I fly over the bamboo patch two circles each way, waiting to take fire. No fire. So we sat down on this little grassy landing strip, and my co-pilot and I, we take our guns off, because we don't want to go into a pistol, you know what I mean? You don't take a pistol to a machine gun fight. So we drop everything, and we walk in, and here's this little village, and it's swap meat day, and they're out there selling chickens and cabbages and all this stuff. And we're walking down this little village, and they're going, who are these two guys? <laughs> what are they doing here? This is the enemy country. Hi, we're just here. We're not Marines, we're merchants. We come to buy gold. And so we walk up to that shack, and we're negotiating with this woman, and she will not budge. This is part of the game. You're a square if you don't haggle. And she kept using this one word called spot. Spot. Today it's spot. I had to pay spot. And spot means today, this is the price of gold all over the world. It does not change. It's today is the price. And she wouldn't budge. And I realize here I'm a college educated, like both college educated young men, and we don't nothing. So then this guy starts screaming and yelling. He goes, Lieutenant, Lieutenant. He does it all. He and I just start running. And I still remember these villagers going, oh, we should shoot them now. You know, we're running through this village. And this guy, and I kicked this guy's duck. I said, poof, this duck is <laughs> And we get back to our helicopter parked on the grass. And my crew chief goes, it's sinking. Our helicopter is sinking. I said, what? I had parked it on a rice pad. And the thing is stuck because the engine is been going, it's sinking. So we yell at the crew chief, rocket, rocket, you know, just rocket. Well, then this mud starts to fly. <laughs> There's mud everywhere. We're like, okay, keep rocking, keep rocking. And finally, that thing breaks free, pops up into a hover, and this mud is going everywhere. We're covered in mud. Crew chief jumps out, I take control, and we fly back. So we fly back to the carrier. Our partnership's dissolved. He says, you're an idiot. We come looking for gold. You don't know what gold is. He says, well, you're an idiot, too. You don't know what gold is, you know? And we're arguing all the way back to the ship, covered in mud, aircraft covered in mud. And then I realized we knew nothing about money. <laughs> books have been translated into 51 languages. 27 million books have been sold worldwide. I'm very proud and pleased to introduce Mr. Robert Kiyosaki. One of the greatest formulas in wealth, and there's many formulas, there's a million doors to financial heaven. One of the doors is four greenhouses, one red hotel. 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 That's it. Gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Robert Kiyosaki. Well, welcome, Robert. As I get to know people who have had amazing success, I always want to know where they came from. So tell me a little bit about growing up Robert Kiyosaki. I always uh, find that word success entertaining, you know, because uh, from my background, I'm the biggest screw up there ever was. It wasn't easy. You know, the road to success is not easy. I 
I didn't know I was poor until I was nine years old. I was living in this little town called Hilo, Hawaii, a sugar plantation town. And the reason I knew I was poor is I went to a rich white school. And it, was, it just happened the way the lines drawn in the you know, school district. So I am in school with all these rich white kids. So the way you know you're poor is I had a jump bike, they had new bikes. Their parents belonged to the yacht club or the country club. And I was a caddy at the country club, you know what I mean? It's the classic story, but I didn't know it was that stark. The story of rich dad, poor dad, is like my poor dad was the head of education for Hawaii, smart guy, PhD. But I wasn't smart, <laughs> it's a big problem, you know, that's to say the cobbler's kids has no shoes, and I had no brains, I hated school. And then my rich dad was my best friend's father, and the twain, the, the two of them came together because I was nine years old. And one day I raised my hand in, in the fourth grade and I asked my teacher, I said, when am I gonna learn about money? And the teacher says, well, we don't teach money at school. You know, I could almost hear her say, the love of money is the root of all evil, you know? And she gave me this religious stuff. So then I got a little bit upset. So finally she says to me, she goes, well, why don't you ask your father? After all, he's my boss. You know, he was the head of education. So I go ask my old man. He says, well, when am I going to learn about money? And he says, we don't teach kids about money in school. I said, why not? He goes, because the government tells us what I can teach. And that's why we have such a financial crisis on our hands. And so the reason I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad way back when was I could see this financial crisis coming. I predicted the biggest market crash in history would come on 2016, plus or minus three years. 2016, plus or minus a few years. So that's why I'm glad you guys are here, because at least you're getting ahead of the curve. Yeah. And so I went to meet my rich dad one day, because he was my classmate was my best friend, and he and I were, he was part Asian, I'm Asian. He drove his son to school in a dump truck. And, you know, Rich Dad's son was so embarrassed because, you know, the rich white kids have the nice cars, you know, the Ford station wagons with the panels on them and all this stuff. But it was my poor dad, you know, the PhD, who says, your friend's father will someday be a rich man. And I said, why is that? He says, because he's an entrepreneur. And I said, what's an entrepreneur? He says, somebody doesn't need a job. <laughs> And I said, what are you, to my father? And he says, I'm an employee. And so the twain started, you know, the, the whole world started to split apart to me. And uh, I went to ask Rich Dad about money. It was at that moment that Rich Dad shared the pivotal point of view that separated him from his employees and my poor dad, and led him to eventually become one of the richest men in Hawaii. The poor and the middle class work for money the rich have money work for them. Time out. During this program, you'll hear a lot about ESBNI, also known as the cash flow quadrant. E stands for employee. Employees have a job. S stands for self-employed small business or specialist, like a doctor or lawyer. These people own a job. B stands for big business, 500 employees or more, and these people have other people working for them. And I stands for an investor, and investors have their money work for them. Now my poor dad always said to me, go to school and get a job, and he wanted to be, become an employee or a specialist like a doctor or a lawyer. My rich dad said, if you want to be rich, you have to be on the business owner or the I side. And that's the difference between my rich dad and my poor dad. If you look at I used to fight with my dad, by the time I was in high school, I'd just fight with him saying, I don't want to be an employee. You know, I just don't want to do it. And I was flunking out of high school and all this stuff. So my mom finally intervened, and my mom was a registered nurse. And she says, Robert, you know, stop arguing with your dad. If you want to be rich, go to school and become a doctor. And I said, Mom, there's only one problem. She says, what's that? She says, doctors are smart. She says, you've got a good point there. You know, you don't... <laughs> So early on in my life, I knew I wasn't going to survive here. It was obvious to me. On the other side of it, my rich dad says to me, he says, Robert, are you lazy? I said, yeah. And he says, are you incompetent? 
I said, yeah. And you're not very bright, are you? I said, no. He says, good, you'll do well in business here. So that's nine years old, so pretty uh, self-aware, obviously, and, and a lot of that was driven by the golf course and some of these other things. How did that progress from there? And to tell me about sort of middle school and high school. Did you perform well academically? Did you figure out the system? Did you not care? I flunked out of high school twice because I can't write. And my, my education's horrible. But ironically, today I'm a best-selling author. <laughs> <laughs> But thank God I had a great uh, high school guidance counselor. And I walked into her office, you know, she says, you know, Robert, what are you gonna do when you grow up? What do you wanna become? And what school do you wanna to go to? And I said, I'm not gonna to talk to you anymore. She goes, why not? I was so belligerent. I was the captain of the football team and all this. I just wanted to learn about money. And she says, well, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And I said, I'm not gonna tell you. She says, why not? I so said, I know the answer you're looking for. You want me to say, I'm gonna grow up to be like my dad and become a school teacher. I'm never gonna do that, I hate school. And I had just seen Mutiny on the Bounty with Marlon Brando, you know. And there was a scene where the, the Tahitian maidens are paddling out to the boat with nothing on but flower lace. And I said, that looks good to me. <laughs> so she says to me, she says, here's a school that's perfect for you. And with that, I went to the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, it's one of the five federal academies. Very tough school to get into. I sailed to Tahiti, went to Quinn's Bar, and had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, and then tell us about uh, sort of leaving uh, college and, and enrolling, or did you get drafted? Or So I graduated sailing for Standard Oil of California. I was an oil tanker officer out of San Francisco. But the Vietnam War was on, and my conscience got to me. The war in Vietnam is a combined and joint effort. The man who is there, soldier, sailor, marine, or airman, American, Korean, South Vietnamese, Australian, or New Zealander, already knows this well. And all that was draft exempt because of the three little letters, O-I-L. If you're a non-defense vital industry, you don't have to fight. So I was draft exempt. They, dra they drafted my kid brother. It was really horrible. You know, you're, you're too young to know those days. But guys were running to Canada. <laughs> Some guys were even staying in school to avoid the draft, you know. But I volunteered and I joined the Marine Corps and I went to flight school in Pensacola. And then two years later, I was in Vietnam. The best decision of my life. It was a great experience. You know, some guys came back with PTSD, which is horrible. But as pilots, you know, it's a pretty nice life. They have showers and beds and all that. I went down three times, I had three crashes. But in Vietnam, as I write about in my latest book, Fake, my rich dad wrote me a letter by snail mail. It took like a month for us to get letters. So my rich dad wrote me this letter saying, hey, watch out. The world's about to change. I remember, the world's about to change. This is Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. What does it mean the dollar's not on the gold standard? He says, it's gonna change. So again, I'm curious about money and not, not, not teaching us anything about money. So my co-pilot and I form a business partnership <laughs> and we become gold prospectors. <laughs> and we're reading this map of Vietnam and it says, you know, this little pick and shovel with AU, gold. I said, okay, we're gonna buy some gold at discount. Proving that Marines aren't the brightest guys in the world. We fly to this gold mine in, in enemy territory, walk up to this little vendor trying to sell us gold. And my thought was, since we're behind enemy lines, it was about $50 an ounce back then. It was 35, and it floated to about 48 or 49. And I tried to get her to discount to maybe back to 38 or 39. <laughs> she, she's a little tiny Vietnamese woman with a little red teeth as she chew beetle nuts. She says, what? You want this cup? Are you nuts? <laughs> and then I realized we knew nothing about money. She knew more about money than I did. It was the best years of my life. I was knocked down three times but kept coming back alive. And, uh, And then one day, off the South China Sea, I lift off my aircraft carrier, 
I looked down at my gauges, you know, flying around with this, and I could see something flickering. I said, oh my God. Here I am with rockets, machine gun, a crew of five. I go, oh my God. It's, it's, it's called the NG gauge. I meant there was something wrong with my turbines. Suddenly, boom, the thing quits. You know, the stomach comes up. All of a sudden, I'm looking down like this, and the natural tendency for anybody in that situation is to pull back, pull back. But the Marine Corps and Navy trains us so well, the moment that engine quit, we're trained by practice to push forward. So the people that will be successful in this room are the people that when it gets tough, you push forward. Well, when I came back from Vietnam, my poor dad was a very honest man. You know, he was the Japanese fairly tall, six foot four. They wanted him to run for lieutenant governor of the state of Hawaii. He was a governor's right-hand man for education. But the governor was an ex-cop, and the head of the syndicate for Hawaii is an ex-cop. They were best friends. So my dad, unfortunately, says, I can't stomach this anymore. I cannot stomach corruption. Very honest man. So he resigned to run for lieutenant governor against his boss, the governor, and when he lost, the governor says, you will never work again. He had no job, no paycheck, and he blew his pension out trying to buy a ice cream franchise to survive on it. The ice cream franchise went bankrupt. So by the time I got back from Vietnam, my old man, PhD, was broke. So my, my poor dad wasn't poor until he lost his job, his paycheck, and his pension. If you follow the advice of work hard, save money, invest in a 401k for the rest of your life, you'll work all your life and you might not have anything to show for it if the market crashes, if there's no social security. So I had a goal to increase my financial intelligence and do my best to retire in the second quarter. So that's why I continue to write and I speak, although I don't need the money. Retire young or as young as you can, even over here, and start enjoying life. To me, it makes no sense to work hard all your life and then to go into overtime and out of time and still not have enough money. Poor dad says, but what should I do, dad? He goes, I'll get your MBA. And so I did. And my rich dad said, if you're going to be rich, you have to learn real estate. So while I'm still a marine pilot, I went to the University of Hawaii for my MBA program. It lasted six months. So and I took this little real estate course I was watching infomercials at night, and this guy says, you too can learn to invest in real estate. So I walked in, I signed up, it was $385, and for a marine pilot in 1973 by now, that was 50% of my paycheck, and three days. So he says, when you end Monday morning, your job is to look at 100 properties. So I knocked on the doors, we find these deals, we have to go look at them, and we have to write down. You know, it was a three bedroom, two bath, da 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 da. At the end of the process, I'd gone through a hundred deals, and it was like, wow. I learned more going through the process, talking to real estate agents, knocking on doors. Finally, this guy says, well, I got what you're looking for on the island of Maui. Little one bedroom, one bath condo for $18,000. But the deal was, I could not use any of my money. That was, the advisor said, I'm going to teach you, so you'll never need to use your money again. He wanted 10% down, which was 1800 I broke out my MasterCard, and I gave it to him, so I put 1800 on the MasterCard. He refinanced, the seller refinanced it. So now I had 100% debt on this little unit, and I made 25 bucks net. So I had no money in the deal, and I made $25 a month. No money in the deal, $25 a month. It blew my brain apart. And since then, I've never worked for money because you don't need money if you have financial education. Now, you started uh, shortly after that a business called Rippers. Tell us about that one. Well, I started the first nylon and Velcro surfer wallet business because my rich dad said to me, he goes, you've got to, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, you, you gotta have to start. So now I'm 10 years older. Well, let me show you one of my first products here. And this was a nylon and Velcro surfer wallet. When I was at school in New York at the Merchant Marine Academy, and we used to sew these products out of sailcloth because we, we were a sailing school. And we started manufacturing them. We took them to Korea. We had 100,000 made, 25,000 red, 
blue, green, yellow, shipped them to New York, and we started shipping them into the market. They didn't sell. <laughs> We're going broke so fast. Here, I had a great product. But by what my rich dad was saying, he says, you don't have a great business. There's a mission, your team, leadership, there's product, legal, systems, communications, and cash flow or accounting. The reason so many businesses fail, I think nine out of 10 fail in the first five years, and of those that survive, 90% of them fail in the next 10 years. And the reason they fail is because one or more of the parts of the triangle are missing. So it's not what you know, it's what you don't know. Stress caused me to think, and so, I was in Golden Gate Park, and I read this paper, and it says, Jogger has his car stolen. And what happened was the Jogger had gone to Golden Gate Park, took his Kia, and put it on top of his car tire. A very big problem for Joggers, because they put the key around their neck, and they would beat it against them. So the question was, where does the Jogger put their key? So since my background is a little bit of engineering from the academy, I invented what's called a shoe pocket. And went on the runner's shoes, you could put a key inside this thing, you could put some money, but also it came with an ID card, just in case you dropped over dead, they want to know who the body was. It was in the Playboy magazine, and Runner's World magazine, and all that. And it became the number one selling product in sporting goods in America. And so people would call up and say, this shoe pocket is great, what else can you sell us? I said, I got some wallets. <laughs> boxes, boxes, I cannot fit in the boxes. Stop it, stop it. Quitting was never an option. Exhausted, exhausted. This passion is never exhausted. And you cannot stop it. Nah, you cannot stop it. And then from there, I saw every surfer kid in Hawaii had this little bumper sticker that said 98 Rock. What's 98 Rock? So I knock on the radio station's door, and this guy named Brian comes in. Brian was a marketer. He says, 98 Rock's the hottest thing in rock and roll. He says, hey, you make wallets, right? And I said, yeah. He says, can you silk screen 98 Rock on them? With that, I got into the rock and roll business, and that became, 98 Rock became the most powerful rock merchandising program in the 80s. Meanwhile, we're hand to mouth. We have no money. It takes a lot of money to keep this thing's finance. So the debt kept climbing, and then one day, I just couldn't keep it going anymore. <laughs> the debt thing came crashing down. And you cannot stop it. Nah, you cannot stop it. You fail faster. The more meetings you have, you fail faster. The more people you talk to, the faster you fail. The faster you fail, the more successful you become. And the reason I learned that is when I came back from Vietnam, 1973, you know, I, I had a decision. I'm going to talk to my, am I going to follow my poor dad's footsteps or my rich dad's footsteps? And in 1973, I said, I'm going, to, I'm going to join my rich dad. And so my rich dad said to me, which is why you guys are here, if you're going to learn how to, to be an entrepreneur, you've got to sell. You've got to learn to handle rejection. You've got to learn to deal with people. And this is the key to success. Fail faster. Around that time, sometime you met Kim. Tell me about meeting her. Well, the transition was, is one day I was really tired of scrambling for dollars all the time. I mean, it, it took everything I, you know, people say success is great. Success is expensive. You know, to, to be constantly cash flowing millions of dollars of inventory just to keep them thing going was, was killer. So when it crashed down, I was now depressed. And I started looking for other answers and all this. And my rich dad said, hey, don't worry. You know, he says, most entrepreneurs lose two or three businesses. You got one more to go. I was studying with Bucky Fuller. Buckminster Fuller, a guy who created the geodesic dome. He's considered one of the greatest geniuses of our time. He's also a futurist. To the young, he is a combination Superman and saint. To the middle-aged, he represents hope for the future. To the old, he personifies hard work and wisdom. To the world at large, he is Buckminster Fuller. The word synergy is the only word that has its particular meaning. And what it means is behavior of whole... There's a strong spiritual undercurrent in Fuller's ideas, and his search for universal order has led him to incorporate much of what he believes into his designs. So Fuller passes on July 1st, 1983. I studied with him for three years. And he was teaching me how to see the future. Months later, his latest book comes out, Grunge of Giants. And grunge stands for gross 
universal cash heist. It is how the ultra-rich rip us off. And you know, the Buddhists have this saying called Satori. Satori means it's like the heavens open for a brief moment and your mind reconnects. I didn't understand this math, I didn't stand all of this other stuff, but I understood cash heist. And I understood why we don't teach kids about money in school. I understood a lot of things that my rich dad was telling me. So at that point, I had to get out of rock and roll. I said, I can't do this anymore. I've, I've got to find the who is grunge. So I sold my rock and roll business same time I meet Kim. She was living in Hot Lolo, I was living in Hot Lolo. I saw her, I thought, God has been good, you know, and all this stuff. <laughs> Started the nylon and Velcro surf and wallet business and were very successful, but the business crashed. And I was, I was stuck with all the debt and in loans. So when I met her, you know, I was flat broke. And I said, I'm gonna follow my dreams and I'm gonna move to uh, San Diego. And I said, I'm going to move to California. I don't know why, but I have to do so. I can't stay here. You get that feeling? You know you can't stay, but you don't know where you're going. That was me. And so I kept telling, talking to Kim about life's purpose and what is your mission in life. Did, did God send you here to do something? I knew there was more to life than just earning a living. And so that kind of, I had been searching for this. I actually started when I was 18 years old, um, kind of looking for what's the meaning of life. Um, and so I found a partner who was on the same search as I was. And then Kim says, can I go with you? And it was like, it's like God sent her to me at that moment. We've been together for 30 something years now. I wouldn't be here without her. She and I moved here to San Diego with nothing. We were homeless up on Del Mar Beach for about a week, but we kept going. She didn't quit on me. And then if, and by 1980, that was 1984, 1986, we got married, and we honeymooned right here next door to this hotel. So, <laughs> you know, Del Mar Beach was just beautiful, right? You know, just north of San Diego and south of LA. But we're living in our car. We had no place to go. We had no money. We're down to, you know, same old story. Where you're down to your last five bucks or two bucks, you know. And we're living in this car. I still remember. I said, well, let's just blow it. I think, I think we had $15 left, and we was cold, and we checked into the Red Roof Hotel, motel or something. And across the street was a Colonel Sanders, <laughs> so we splurged. We bought a bucket of fried chicken and a six-pack of Bud, and we thought we were in heaven, but we were now flat broke. We had nothing. We were at the end. And always, as Bucky Fuller says, always and only the nick of time, something else happens. And just at that time, a friend of ours says, you know, why don't you live in my basement? I mean, I'm not kidding. Uh, so we check into her basement <laughs> in Del Mar. And so a friend of ours came cruising back from Australia and says, would you like to teach in Australia? I said, well, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I'm kind of unemployed. So a few months later, we flew to Australia, and I did this course, taught, it, taught what I was teaching, and Australia just opened the doors to me. We're the hottest finance seminar in town, and uh, we got so successful, the government of Australia was sending people to us for transformation. What you're gonna learn today is that it's very, 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 very simple. But then something happened. It was called David Koresh in Waco, Texas. Apparently, when that whole thing with the ATF and who they, the people they killed were Australians. So here I am in Australia, and the church starts looking for American cult leaders because we're so popular. And says, we want to do a story about you. We said, oh, 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 thank you, Jesus. You know, we're saved. So, so those guys come sneaking in with their cameras and all this. And for some reason, I couldn't be there. So my friend taught for me. If you think you know something about business, this could be your game. And if you know nothing about business, this could also be your life. He does this. And so the camera angle comes up and catches him. Boom! 
cult leader. <laughs> oh God. So we get blasted with David Koresh. I don't even know who Koresh is. And the thing just blows apart. Our business goes down, they come after us, you know, like, and uh, all I'm trying to do is help people with money. So then we, we come back to the States. I was living in, Kim and I were living in Phoenix at that time. We were just depressed for about two months, you know, and I said, again, it's the same thing as, well, what is the lesson? You know, it, if something bad happens, you got two choices. You can go up or you can go down. And I was getting depressed and I was going down. I said, you know, I was just trying to help people. But then the question was, what did I not do? And what I did not do was because of the seminar, people couldn't see what we did. So they'd pop into the seminar on one day and pop out happy a few days later. And so people thought we we're some kind of religious cult. And I said, I just, well then I should just take the doors away and show people what I do. So that was um, 96. By then, a couple of years had passed. You know, it's a good thing I had real estate to keep me alive by then. But uh, I developed a cash flow game. And the cash flow game basically took what we were teaching inside a seminar and we put it into a box so people could look at it. So this here is the cash flow game. There's actually two game boards. This is the first one. The first thing here you notice, there's two tracks. This is called the fast track. And this is called Zerat Race. And most people are trapped in Zerat Race. So if you follow the advice of go to school and get a safe, secure job and buy a house and have kids, you get stuck inside this rat race and you never get out. So the object of the cash flow game is to increase your financial IQ so you can get out of the rat race, to have more passive income so you don't have to work anymore, so your money's working hard for you. And then you get on the fast track. So to invest out here, number one, you have to be rich, and number two, you should be financially educated. You know, it was just finance. And when people play the game, they get excited because they know they can take control of money in their lives. That's all it is. It's an accounting game. Accounting, that's all it is. The trouble was I couldn't sell the game. So somebody says, well, how are you gonna sell this stupid game? I don't know. So I wrote a brochure in 97, because I had to explain what the game taught, that the seminar taught. And the brochure is called Rich Dad Poor Dad. Dream big, cause boy, you're gonna make it. Stand tall, there's a higher road you're taking. Let go of everything that you know, and be wild in the mystery. Yeah. So I released it in 1997. Every book publisher turned us down, saying, you don't know what you're talking about. How can you say savers are losers? We do not really subscribe to the idea of being a saver. We think it's more important you learn to be an investor. Savers are losers. How can you say a house is not an asset? Where people get mixed up is they call their house an asset. So they came after me for that one too. But we, so we had to self-publish. And in 99, I made the New York Times bestseller list. as the only self-published book on the list. And then a woman named Oprah Winfrey called. And then that old saying, well, I guess it's too late to practice now. So I said, you can't be this little kid from Hilo, Hawaii, little shy kid and all this stuff. You better start selling. This is the most important sales job you gotta do. So she comes on stage, she goes, ah, the whole audience is going crazy. And, all. and here he is, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Oh, that's great. And I go, oh, back. Like you say, you can't turn back. At the end of the program, she turned to me and she goes, hey, Rich Dad, I just sold five million copies of your book. I went, holy mackerel. So the math was really tough. I make $5 a book. <laughs> so five times five million? I said, holy mackerel. I've never made so much money like that. And so that was 20 something years ago, 25 years ago. When I had no money, I had my plan. And my plan was to build a business. I was a little kid. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to buy real estate. And I'm going to be an oil man. So that's why when I went to school in New York, my business was oil. I drove oil tankers for Standard Oil just to know the business. 
When I had no money, and I've had a lot, I've not had money many times, I still had my plan. It was business, I take real estate classes, and I understand oil. That's my plan. But you've got to have your plan too. Then, you know, my wife and I have big houses, we have our yacht, we have, I have two Ferraris and all that. Big deal. If you do this job here, you can have as much as you want here. So what's the Rich Dad Company up to today? The, uh, we just had a meeting yesterday in Phoenix. Our goal is to teach financial education to the world. Cash flow clubs are very simply a group of people that get together on a regular basis. It might be three people, it might be a thousand people, whatever the club is, and they get together on a regular basis and they play cash flow, the board game. We're going to create cash flow clubs. We wire it up to the web. And then we can teach via the web, sort of like YouTube, into these cash flow clubs. And then the cash flow clubs can go into their societies, like you know Argentina or Greece, and they can teach people. See, the problem is poverty is accelerating throughout the world. We need to teach people to teach other people. But we can do it by organizing a club, because the cash flow club's power is they have fun. My financial education started playing Monopoly. I'm nine years old. I asked my rich I said, why am I playing Monopoly? He says, well, it's about time you asked. So what am I learning? He says, one of the greatest formulas in wealth, and there's many formulas. He's always said, there's a million doors to financial heaven. He says, one of the doors to financial heaven is found in this board game. And I said, what's the door? He says, it's four greenhouses, one red hotel. I went, is that it? He goes, that's it. It didn't compute in poor dad's mind. My dad's a very smart man, you know, valedictorian, Stanford, Northwestern University of Chicago, academic type. Playing Monopoly did not compute <laughs> as far as education goes. And so my rich dad took his son and me <clears throat> out to his swampy area in Hilo, Hawaii. And he had Quonset huts made out of military stuff. My poor dad said he's a slumlord. Your, your, your friend's father's a slumlord. And my rich dad says, I'm a low-income housing provider. <laughs> and they had two different points of view on everything. So I'm caught in this crossfire. 10 years later, I'm in school in New York. I'm now 19. I returned to Hawaii. And rich dad had bought the big red hotel smack dab in Waikiki Beach. And I'm going, holy, he just worked his plan. Very smart man, he just stayed with his plan. He did what's called in real estate an assembly. You know, he bought all the pieces around him. He just took his time, bought the pieces around him. He paid 1.2 million for that property. They just sold it for 800 million. It was called a Hyatt Regency, Waikiki. So the purpose of education is to inspire you to learn more. My rich dad had fun teaching me to play Monopoly. I wanted to learn more. So that's my objective. And then we can change the world that way. That's my, and I'm 72, that's the last shot. I'm out of here. <laughs> I believe I've heard it through several messages, but how would you articulate why you're so passionate about teaching real financial education? Well, I'm still trying to save my father. That's all. When I came back from Vietnam, he was unemployed. As I write in several places, I think I saw the future. My generation. No jobs, no pensions, no paychecks. The best news is, is that all of us can get off the system pretty quickly if we have the proper education. And one of the best lessons I learned in Sunday school was about the three wise men. You know, the wise men went in search of another wise man, the new teacher. You know, that story was Christ. I'm not pumping religion, I want to do that. But I think one of the things that all of us can do now is seek your own teachers. That's probably the most important thing you can do. That's why I keep going. Mm -hmm.